we need to move to the next subject. Exactly. It is uh, related to, hi. this is related to the lungs. What is new in the management of pulmonary hypertension? So may I request Dr. Shoro Mukherjee and Dr. P.K. Hajra to chair the session. Shoro, you remain as a chairperson and Dr. Hajra, you please take Thank over. You, and uh, the speaker is Dr. Arindam Pandey. What is new in the management of pulmonary hypertension? Arindam, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak in this August forum. And I, I was seeing fantastic program which is going on. So uh, basically, uh, if we see that there had been different classifications of uh, pulmonary hypertension, but one of the three definitions which actually suits very well for the management purpose is the pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension, isolated post-capillary pulmonary hypertension, and combined type. So how do we differentiate? In pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension, the pulmonary artery wedge pressure will be less, so it will be lesser than equal to 15. At the same time, the mean pulmonary artery pressure will be more than 20 and PVR will be also high. Now, isolated post-capillary pulmonary arterial hypertension is not very common, but here the PVR is going to be less, but the mean pulmonary artery pressure as well as pulmonary artery wedge pressure will be high. And in combined type, where both post-capillary and pre-capillary uh, derangement and pathophysiology is there. Here, everything is going to be high, both PVR, pulmonary artery wedge pressure, and mean pulmonary artery pressure. So for our practical purpose, we should concern uh, very much about the pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension, which is the commonest form of idiopathic pulmonary hyper arterial hypertension. And all our effort to treat the pulmonary arterial hypertension is to treat this subset only. Now, PAH, now the recent concept is to uh, have something called directed therapies. For To understand directed therapy, now there are three gross current uh, you know, therapy targets. One of the target is endothelin pathway, second is nitric oxide pathway, and third is postocycline pathway. So endothelin pathway, it works to endothelin 1 receptor. So we do have endothelin receptor A and B, and we, we can block them. And there are multiple agents starting from bosentan, ambisentan, and recently macitentan, which works through this pathway. Second is the age-old nitric oxide pathway, where L-arginine plays a very vital role. And nitric oxide, as we all know, cyclic guanylate uh, cyclase is very important to generate cyclic GMP. So cyclic uh, GMP, cyclic guanylate cyclase stimulator is one of the latest innovation in the therapy of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Dr. P.K. Hajra is also there as a chairperson. He will be very excited about very guard, but we do have uh, older molecule, which initially was actually evaluated in pulmonary arterial hyper hypertension treatment only. Then we do have uh, phosphodiesterase inhibitor, which are actually sildenafil, later on tadalafil, which is the longer acting version of it and lesser side effect. All those things are al also playing very important vital role in the therapy of this condition. Now, prostacycline pathway mostly reserved for very advanced uh, situation because initially all the molecules were parenteral. So there are postacycline derivative. Now, recent developments are from parenteral IV to subcutaneous. Now they are available in inhalational form as well as oral form. And there is a new development in the form of IP receptor agonist, Selexipac, which has probably changed the uh, you know, whole uh, therapeutic uh, you know, armamentarium of this condition because that is wonderful molecule and extremely effective, which is also available in, in, in our country as well. So briefly, I'll go, go, go through all of them. Now, this is the just uh, elaborated uh, version of the last slide. I'll skip this. So basically, the therapy of this condition, the trials and all research, it, it, if we just date back, it started from 1960s. So at the initial part, there were empirical treatment, mostly vasodilators were uh, used. Then in 1980s, oral anticoagulants was found to be very, very effective. And now, till date also, this is this is also this has become a standard of care in this condition. All majority of the patients are actually receiving some form of oral anticoagulant. Then in 1995, the postacycline era started initially IV, apoprostenol, then in 2001, Bosentan. 
2002 teprostenil, which emerged as a subcutaneous uh, therapy, followed by IV teprostenil, eloprost, later on inhalational eloprost, and sildenafil. It was available in 2005, 2007, and recent then 2009. Tadalafil, another phosphodiesterase inhibitor, and trepostenil. Now it was available in inhalational form, 2010. Uh, thermostable form of ipoprostenol, a postacycline uh, derivative was available. Then Raj Shiagat, the initial trial, uh, was very en encouraging. I'll briefly show that trial, 2013. And Massey and triprostenil oral. So, first time oral postacycline derivative was available, 2013. And the latest uh, established therapy in this uh, particular situation is Selexipac, which was available, 2015. So, these are the different uh, classes of drugs which are available for treatment, mostly the post cycling derivative, initially IV infusion followed by inhalation, iloprost, iprostenil is available in all the form, oral inhalation and subcutaneous as well as IV. post cycling receptor and agonist, the latest development, Selexipac, oral, it is uh, supposed to be started at a dose of 200 microgram twice daily, and gradually we try to build up the dose up to 1600 mi microgram per day. And then there is uh, there are endothelin receptor antagonists in the form of bosentan, ambrisentan, macitentan. All of them are oral. Bosentan had important limitation in the form of hepatotoxicity, which was taken care of by the uh, further generation uh, endothelin receptor antagonist. Phosphorus uh, diesterase. Uh, Five inhibitor, probably the cheapest one uh, to treat this condition. Sildenafil, widely available. Tadalafil, little costlier, but yes, it is also widely available, and we use them very often. And both of them are available oral, and sildenafil IV injection is also available. Soluble cyclic uh, GMP stimulator, Ryasiogat, was uh, evaluated and very found to be very effective and so oral uh, formulation. So if you look at the timeline of the different studies, and you know, but trials. So initially, all the trials, uh, say for example, the trial with Bosentan, Breathe One, and you know, Ambrisentan, Aries One, Aries Two, all of them actually were shorter studies. Basically, they tried to improve the quality of life of the patient, to improve the six minute walking distance, and that, those were the primary outcome. And uh, short duration studies were actually performed. Gradually, initially the studies used to be 32 patients, 200, 150, this kind of small study and small follow-up. Later on, when we got more important and more effective molecule in the form of macitentan, first time in seraphine trial, it, it included 742 patients, and we can see the primary endpoint also change. It, it, the trials become larger, longer study period, and basically even different outcomes. So they tried to look whether the survival benefit is there with the newer molecule. There had been the largest trial uh, in this situation it was with Selexipac in the form of Griffon trial, which included more than 1,000 population, 1,000 uh, patients as in, uh, was evaluated. Then the era of combination therapy, the first landmark trial was ambition trial, where, which combined ambicentan with tadalafil. That was also uh, relatively a larger study with longer follow-up period, and it was also an event-driven uh, you know, uh, trial. So why, why, what it indicates that probably we are getting more effective molecule for treat, treatment of this very, very lethal and you know, fatal disease. Now, coming to the important adverse event, now, uh, we, we all know endothelin receptor antagonist fluid retention is important uh, adverse effect. Anemia and abnormal LFT with Washington, which is well known. They are not tested in pregnant ladies. Hospitalized inhibitor, headache is important. Nasal congestion and GRD, which is not a very simple, uh, important side effect. Prostanoids, headache, and very uh, typical side, uh, side effects of jaw pain and bone, bone pain, particularly if you're using intravenous formulation. Flushing can, can also be there. And line infection and cough, if if you are using inhaled form or injectable form, those are additional adverse effects because they need to take it for a longer period of time. They might be discharged home and they are taking it at home. So this in a, you know, side effects becomes important. Now, soluble guanylate cyclase, uh, Ryasiagat can cause headache, symptomatic uh, hypotension, syncope, dyspepsia, some peripheral edema, and they're also not tried in uh, pregnant ladies. Now, if we look at the 
you know, uh, flow chart, how should, uh, you know, try to treat the algorithm. Then World Symposium of Pulmonary Hypertension 2018 is the latest guideline. And uh, first thing we, we should do to treat this kind of patient is to check the vasoreactivity, whether the uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension is vasoreactive. If it is vasoreactive, then yes, most important treatment is calcium channel blocker. But the dose of calcium channel blocker, which is supposed to be given many a time, is not tolerated by the patient. But if they tolerate, then it works very fantastically. Now, if it is not vasoreactive, then we need to assess whether the patient is having low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. Because uh, this is very important. Say, for example, a patient which is who, who is having right ventricular dysfunction, which is not responding with uh, diuretic therapy, and the functional class of the patient is very advanced, then this, this is a patient who is actually a very high risk patient. And we should initiate combination therapy from the very beginning, including injectable formulation of pro Otherwise, in some of the patients, probably we can we can try monotherapy. So monotherapy is not altogether obsolete, though the fashion nowadays is to start combination therapy from the very beginning as a double drug. I, I'll show you some trials with uh, triple drug combination from the very beginning as well. So there are a group of patients who can respond with monotherapy, say, for example, long-term stable patient, say, or, or in group of patients where combination therapy is unavailable or contraindicated, uh, those kind of patients. And there are some other conditions where monotherapy can actually be tried. Now, uh, there is something called worsening pulmonary arterial hypertension and disease progression. So any patient, when treated with uh, initial therapy, if he doesn't respond or he progresses to the next functional class, then we'll con uh, consider the treatment to be failure and we should try to add on modern therapy or other, you know, next stage therapy, say for example, lung transplantation, balloon arterial septostomy, and, and hospitalization and in-hospital treatment, intravenous treatment, those kind of situation actually arises. Now, basically my job is to discuss about the newer discoveries and new newer avenues in the in this very deadly uh, situation. So one of the uh, new things, new research, actually is concentrated uh, in the field of metabolic basis of pulmonary arterial hypertension. So just I'll quickly touch upon the insight from the NHLBI pulmonary vascular disease phenomics, which is also commonly known as PV domic study. So this is as the you know uh, worldwide network where actually different phenotypes of the disease, pulmonary idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension actually are being analyzed and why they're doing so because the global metabolite group comparison, they actually try to evaluate different protein, nucleotide, and uh, lipid, and they actually classify the patient in different clusters. And this cluster may not be similar to the WHO or World Symposium of Pulmonary Arterial Hypertension cluster. There are 30 top ranking biochemicals in the importance uh, plot suggested by Three differences. So they analyze the amino acid metabolism, lipid metabolism, nucleotide metabolism, and by that, uh, different you know parameters after analysis, it, it, uh, it differentiate the patients into different clusters from cluster one to cluster six. They also take consideration. Uh, you know, important typical marker in the form of distal box from six meter walking test, DLCO, RA pressure, mean pulmonary arterial pressure, cardiac output, cardiac index, uh, and PCWP. And uh, why they are doing it? Because this PV domics they use as deep clinical and panomic phenotyping to identify novel sub phenotypes of pulmonary vascular disease regardless of the World Symposium of Pulmonary Hypertension clinical classification. And preliminary, preliminary metabolic data from this actually reveals that novel metabolic amino acid and lipid cluster that are not defined by the existing group or hemodynamics are there, and they can actually get benefit by targeted therapy of different kinds. So regarding the management, what is new? Yes, uh, there has been a uh, you know, correlation between gut pathology and its rescue uh, by angiotensin converting E2 uh, uh, enzyme in hypoxia induced pulmonary hypertension. So it was uh, found that uh, there has been a link in between uh, ACE2 overexpression for this you know, hypoxia, which is there in gut. And this in future can be one of the target for therapy of this condition. So 
That is also important. Upfront combination therapy, I already mentioned that from the very beginning, in very high risk group of patients, combining two molecules or three molecules from the very beginning is showing very encouraging data. And upfront triple therapy has been evaluated. It started way back in 2014, initial trial. Data shows that if we combine the recovery of the RV function is far, far better compared to uh, single therapy or combination with two therapy. And so this kind of effort is continuing. They are trying to, they are actually trying to find out what are the molecules which can, which we, we should combine from the very beginning. And they are actually analyzing data. This is one of the another trial where ambition plus subcutaneous treprostenil, that means ambricentran plus tadalafil plus subcutaneous treprostenil was used in very sick patient, class four symptomatic patient, or, or class three very high risk feature patients. And the, what was the result? The result was actually very encouraging. All, all the parameters were statistically found to be better starting from right atrial pressure, mean pulmonary arterial pressure and, and the functional class of the patient actually improved in this 24 month follow up. But the problem is all these trials are very small size trial. We cannot conclude that or we should offer this combination, triple or double combination to all the patient. But so far, whatever data we are having in very sick patient, particularly high risk patient, if we combine multiple therapy, we, we should we, the benefit is, is evident. This is another very recent uh, data. 2020 publication of Triton triple therapy, 247 patients, and this found that uh, combining triple therapy in a very sick patient actually is far superior compared to uh, the single therapy or combination two therapy. Now, what is the consensus regarding this multiple, you know, multi-pronged approach from the very beginning? ACC AHA guideline recommend that intravenous or subcutaneous triprostenil as second or third line therapy in patients that are considered low risk while IV aprostenol and triprostenil are considered first line in high risk. So if the patient is high risk, we should go for, you know, injectable form, multiple medication from the very beginning. Similarly, 2015 ESC guideline and 2019 World Symposium on pulmonary arterial hypertension gives similar recommendation that IV prostacycline should be initial therapy in WHO group one functional class four patients only. So that is the consensus. Now, another very important molecule, new molecule I'd rather say is the SOTA tarsept for the treatment of this condition. This actually, uh, you know, bone mineral uh, protein, there is a, you know, uh, disbalance in the growth promoting and growth inhibitory mechanism. And what this molecule does, it actually restores this uh, derangement. Uh, and this is a very novel treatment. Uh, the trial came up in the name of Pulsar trial. And this showed that both the doses, this is available in subcutaneous form, 0.3 milligram per kg and 0.7 milligram per kg. And the result, the Pulsar trial showed that, this is a very important trial, showed both the doses actually is uh, statistically superior com compared to conventional background therapy. So all the patients were optimally treated, treated as per the current guideline. On top of that, this new molecule showed uh, you know, benefit. Now, replace study I already uh, uh, mentioned. This is the study where uh, this uh, molecule Ryasiagat was uh, uh, tried. So one group continued with, with, with phosphodiesterase inhibitor, another group the phosphodiesterase inhibitor was replaced with this new molecule. And what was found in point, the patients were in primary endpoint were met was far, far superior in the ICR guard group. And it was statistically significant with a p-value of 0 0.0007. So this molecule also probably opening a very new avenue and this is available oral. So this can be a very important therapy in this particular condition. Now inhaled tripostanil in this particular situation has also arisen. And the trial with inhaled tripostanil was also found to improve the functional as well as the hard endpoint of the patient. Now, another very important uh, you know, new avenue of treating this condition is the pulmonary artery denervation. Dr. P.K. Hajra might be interested. Uh, so the denervation is uh, you know, shifting based from renal artery to pulmonary artery. So the patient who actually undergone pulmonary thrombo in arterectomy, this group of patient was chosen. And one of the uh, arm, the conventional oral therapy and IV therapy was continued. Another arm, uh, they subjected the patient with denervation, uh, uh, denervation therapy. And what was found, the denervation, we can see the gap in between the 
clear separation clear separation so uh, pulmonary artery denervation is another very new novel therapy which is probably coming in a big way initial trial result is very very promising it reduced the pulmonary vascular resistance in a significant way so other trials to note is uh, Arindam, the time Arindam, is Arindam, yeah, please this is probably my last slide sir Co-op trial that evaluated transcatheter mitral valve repair that also showed by curing mitral regurgitation probably PA pressure can be improved and I think I should stop here. This is the last slide. Yes, so uh, we need to find out the COVID nineteen related pulmonary arterial hypertension how they you know behave. I think I should stop. Thank you, sir. A brilliant, Thank I would you. say, a brilliant uh, talk by Dr. Pandey. Exceptional talk, class one talk. Now, I think uh, the story is still uh, evolving over time. And you ended up with COVID-19 and some of these patients do need uh, lung transplantations. And it is possible in our country. The first line of therapy in any pulmonary hypertension, you have to rule out secondary causes and you have to give continuous oxygen therapy, ambulatory therapy, which is available, affordable and attractive. And sometimes a combination. And he has highlighted the pneumotherapies a device therapy. Only one thing he has not mentioned, and I do have some cases of pulmonary angioplasty, you have to do the CT angio, then you have to do the FFR of the pulmonary artery, smaller branches, and you have to treat them by balloon angioplasty, not by stent. Sequentially, the segmental and subtract segmental branches of the pulmonary artery. Sometimes the combinations, be aware of the side effects like hypotensive. Another therapy in the field of diabetes like SGL2 inhibitors are quite promising in the treatment of pulmonary hypertension, but he has ex exposed uh, a new horizon, a new, uh, new, new, new kind of uh, polypharmacy in pulmonary hypertension. Thank you very much. And over to Dr. Guho and uh, Dr. Shoji. Uh, thank you, Arindam. That was a very lucid lecture, though there's a lot of information and uh, you don't really have a take home from that. Now, one question I want to ask you, in patients with ice and mango, so that is the commonest problem that we face. So what is the drug of choice in such cases? What is the drug of choice to treat the pulmonary hypertension? Sir, that drug of choice, I mentioned that treatment of choice is heart-lung transplantation. You also know that, Eisenmenger. If you really want to cure the disease, we need to transplant both heart as well as lung because the vasculature, there is obliterative pulmonary arterial hypertension. But apart from that, now all the studies are indicating that whatever therapy we are offering to idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension, we should offer them to uh, this Eisenmenger syndrome patient. And they they actually benefit. They benefit and uh, we should offer all the available. As per the functional class, we should see what class the patient is. If, the, if, if they are at a higher class, say for example, very, very sick uh, class three or class four patient, WHO, we should start with IV uh, or, or oral postacycline derivative along with uh, the other conventional therapy in the form of, you know, uh, ambricentan, bosentan, whatever, and phosphodiesterase inhibitor. And also, we do have Selexipap nowadays. Selexipap is uh, okay. available, is marketed by uh, some company in India as well. We should offer. All of them can be offered to this group of patients. Yes. Showed up there. Just Hello. conclude. Uthru, can I ask? Yes, ah, sir. sure. One question. Sure. Yes, yes. Uh, Arindam, Ryosugar cannot be used with phosphodiesterase inhibitor. Yes, so that has to be. First, first line drug. Uh, that is don't the ERA plus. Uh, don't share the screen, screen now. I will tell you. Plus, right, you got. Yes, sir. I see. I got the replace trial clearly shown. You need to stop. And one of the one of the arm they continued with phosphodiesterase inhibitor, and the arm where the ISU got was evaluated. The phosphodiesterase has to be discontinued because if they are used together, there can be potential risk of serious hypotension. Right. Yes, exactly. So a very serious not hypotension does take place. So these two should not be used together. Right. Another thing, what Shodo asked, Bosentan is very often used in combination with a phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors in patients with Eisenmengers. If Bosentan is not tolerated, Amrisentan, but you have rightly said that any drug which, which are used in primary idiopathic hypertension can be used in... Uh, Eisenmenger syndrome as well. Right. I think uh, we are running short of time. Thank you, Arindam. Thank you, Prakash Thank you. and Shoro.